go. Well, thank you to all of our participants on in our first uh, first session this morning. That was a that was a great uh, great exchange, and really appreciate everyone's everyone's uh, inputs. Very 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 well done. Um, which brings us to session two, and um, uh, we have a great topic this morning here. It's uh, deep learning and AI. Has a revolution happened yet? And um, we we've got uh, an outstanding um, uh, roster of, of, of uh, professors to dis discuss these topics today. Starting out with Don Rubin, and uh, Don is the emeritus professor of statistics, Harvard University, and also uh, the distinguished professor of statistical science. Uh, in the Temple University Fox School of Business. Also joining us this morning is Michael Jordan. Uh, Michael hails from the University of California, Berkeley, where he is a professor of statistics and computer science and the Pihong Shen Distinguished Professor. Michael, thank you for being here this morning. Um, also with us, David Donahoe from Stanford University. Uh, David is a professor of statistics and the Ann and Robert Bass Professor of Humanities and Sciences. And uh, join us all the way from Germany. Uh, we're very, very happy to have uh, Michael Kohler this morning. Uh, Michael uh, hails from the Technical University of Darmstadt, and he's a professor of statistics. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for being here with us. And Ed, I'll turn it over to you to begin our session. Thank you. Thank you, John. I also want to welcome and thank our distinguished faculty guests on behalf of the Department of Statistical Science uh, here at Temple University. Uh, so in this session, we're going to take a deep dive into data science and artificial intelligence uh, to better understand these modern phenomena, I would call them. So if we take a brief look at the history of statistics and computer science, we often see ideas that spark research areas, and sometimes they grow into something bigger. And the path to growth, to growth is never the same, however. So I want to just give a brief example. 25 years ago, with the increase of information collection and storage in the industry and the sciences, data mining, the idea of data mining emerged as a new set of techniques at the time. And at the beginning in our profession, data mining was almost a pejorative term. Somebody could say, oh, look at that scientist, it's just data mining. But you know, following innovations in fall discovery rates and other strategies to control errors family-wide, uh, today, data mining can lead to accurate predictions uh, out of samples and also data-driven data scientific discoveries. There's other ideas like big data, for instance, that have been more of a fleeting meme with little uh, to no technical content to support it, you know, somebody would argue. And there are many such examples of, you know, big ideas, including machine learning, compressed sensing, uh, data science, deep learning, and artificial intelligence. Um, so there are many factors to determine whether an idea is going to be successful or not. And uh, I would say what many successful ideas have in common is that they sustain industrial and scientific progress or can inform policy making. And as a consequence, we see new conferences being organized around an idea, new scientific journals, new technical journals, uh, publishing papers around an idea, new academic programs, teaching the skills that are required you know, to master an idea, and so on and so forth. And so with this sort of brief background in mind, now I would say data science and artificial intelligence have proven to be very special ideas that keep coming back, being rediscovered and revisited over the years. Um, and so if we consider data science to start, for instance, most top universities nowadays offer a program or multiple programs in data science and have devoted uh, other significant resources to data science related initiatives. Uh, some of the academic departments have even renamed themselves to include data science in the name of the department. And the demand for data science, data scientists in industry is at an all time high. So to understand this phenomenon more in depth, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, David Donahoe, who has recently written an informative and influential piece about data science. Uh, David, uh, turn it over to you. Thank you for being here. So first of all, let's just uh, sound check. Are people hearing me? Okay. Uh, and secondly, I just wanted to discuss a copyright matter. I'll use a number of uh, results of Google image searches, which any of you could do for yourself and find you know similar images. They may be copyrighted, but they're only being presented here for non-commercial educational purposes. 
Now about the title, the revolution has happened, but credit has been stolen. So uh, of course, this is an homage to Michael Jordan's nice article in the Harvard Data Science Review, the AI revolution hasn't happened yet, which perhaps he'll tell us more about, and is also, of course, used in the title for this session. Um, what I wanted to do here was to clarify some things about what's actually happened and the language that we should use for talking about it as a way to kind of improve our ability among ourselves to really understand what's going on and what's likely to happen next. So I, I wanna point out that in the you know, last 10 years, there really has been a revolution that's taken place and we're all very fortunate to have lived through this revolution. Uh, we will be marked for the rest of our lives by the fact that we knew the world before the revolution and we will be part of what comes after the revolution. And we will recognize this as the largest civilizational event that has happened certainly in more than a hundred years. And, perhaps 100 years in the future. Next slide. That the revolution has its roots in what I'll call the smartphone revolution. 10 years ago, if you went to India, as I did, and you took a standard guidebook, then they would tell you that if you went into villages there you would see things outside of the, you know, usual touristic sites. You would see things there that really hadn't changed in 2000 years. Basically, there were farmers who maybe owned a cow and maybe lived in a dung hut and maybe burned dung. And the information that they had was just what was passed down by word of mouth from the other farmers. What has actually happened in the 10 years since is that smartphones became quasi ubiquitous. They've of course gone through various generations. It started out with the you know, more traditional phones that didn't have displays, but today smartphones are needed just to be a farmer, a peasant farmer in any of the um, major countries like China, India, or any of the African countries where there's large rural peasant populations. And uh, of course this has massive consequences because the information available, particularly to young people has completely leapfrogged any expectations that we could have had in 2010. I don't think anyone really saw this coming at, to the degree that it's actually happening. And it's very easy for us to forget the significance of actually putting all 8 billion humans in immediate contact with all information. Really, this is epical. We won't forget it. It'll become only more and more dominant in our thinking over time. When we think about what has happened that we've lived through, this is it. This is the big thing that will mark our lives. Next slide. Now in the uh, wealthy countries, of course, we saw the effects first. So it, what was kind of uh, obvious was that human behavior was transformed so that there were, you know, teenagers and other young people using cell phones for many hours a day and using them in ways that the older generation could not have anticipated or maybe wouldn't approve of creating social media, using selfies and so on. The word of the year, in 2013 for the Oxford English Dictionary was selfie. 
So we may think of that as, you know, something that's been around forever. No, it was actually invented during this decade, as were many, many other human habits that we now consider completely second nature. So uh, hours per day on mobile devices is scaled upwards and upwards so that it's now at the place of like four to six hours a day, depending on the country, depending on various particular habits. Um, and uh, another telling fact is that humans are now uploading on their devices more than a trillion images a year, just still images. And in the hundred billions of videos, just casual video taken for the purposes of maybe a TikTok or some other similar social media purpose, okay? So we, we probably don't think about this too much. We think of this as simply uh, kind of teenagers doing trivial stuff, but the, the consequences of this are utterly profound. And I don't mean the consequences on the cervical spine injury rate, which will also be enormous. I'm talking about the consequences that we had to build out a global computational and communications infrastructure to make any of this possible. Next slide, please. Because as part of this model, you're going to have eight plus billion people's devices checking with cloud servers many thousands of times a day. You have to build out a massive network of data centers. In some cases, you had to create new transoceanic cables in order to carry the fiber optics to places that had geothermal energy or that were close to the poles in order to uh, you know, save money on, on the cooling of the data centers and exploit natural um, renewable energy. So here's, for example, a data center built, I think by um, possibly by Facebook that's north of the Arctic Circle in the, in the lower left of the picture. And these data centers have, you know, many, many thousands of computers in them. Amazon data centers all told to have more than 50 million CPUs. And so uh, just the infrastructure to do all the things we now take for granted that's utterly trivial is actually an amazing engineering achievement and it's required a utterly massive capital investment on the part of you know amazon google facebook all those companies that are at the top of the league tables for market capitalization these days next slide now as a corollary of this, there are many consequences. So I've already mentioned the unknown consequences that this development might have for children's social habits and maybe their psychological development. There are also unknown consequences for political development in India and Africa and China of all these peasants who previously didn't have any uh, connection to what politicians were saying or doing and who suddenly have the information that they never had before. And I mentioned, you know, cervical spine injuries, which are going to be endemic and are gonna uh, affect all these young people who are craning their necks over the devices endlessly, so on and so forth. Well, those are many, many corollaries of this. I don't want to focus on them, but you know, we will be living with consequences like that forever. What I do want to focus on is that a corollary of this global computational 
infrastructure combined with communications is that um, our ability to train machine learning models has completely been transformed so that if we uh, make a plot as shown here of how many, um, essentially an index of computational intensiveness as a function of year for winning models in machine learning competitions, they've gone up by tremendous factors, roughly a 300,000 X increase in computational ability has been experienced during this decade as people exploited that global computational infrastructure. You can now, instead of doing things like you would 10 years ago of use your laptop or a desktop or a local cluster, you can scale up a computation to some cloud system and access 100,000 CPUs in, in really you know, utter convenience and simplicity. In consequence, uh, very complicated machine learning models have been built and we know that as a consequence of that, science now today understands that, that we can do things that we never thought we could do 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, there was a meeting in London between uh, an American uh, mathematician, computer science, who made a bet that he could beat any Go program on earth. And uh, John Trump is his name. And he won that bet. He had carefully defined the rules so that there could be no communication outside the room in which it would be placed. And he had to play against a single CPU running whatever software the opponents put on it. And he, he actually beat the competition. He's, he's, and he's not the world champion or anything. But uh, today everyone knows that the, the world's supreme master of Go has been utterly destroyed by Alpha Go Zero. And no one expects that ever in the rest of human history, it will be possible for a human to beat machines if we play on the home turf of what the machines want to play on, which is to use this global computational and communications infrastructure on their side. That's how the world is transformed, okay? So this massive computational scaling up that's happened, it's completely changed what we think can be accomplished. And so we're in a new world. Uh, could I just ask how we're doing for time? Because I'm afraid that we're gonna, I'm gonna run out of time here. Uh, you're doing great so far, David. How much more time do I have? Um, let's say 20 minutes. Okay. So uh, next slide, please. So we've arrived at the moment of computing supremacy. Computing supremacy to me means that essentially humans are not in the game ideas are not in the game. Nothing that, that we've traditionally considered as intellectually respectable is in the game. What's in the game is crushing computational raw power. As, as an example of that, I'd point to this recent paper from Google AI. Uh, I teach a class at Stanford and last year at about this time, we had Orhan Firat from Google AI come and make a presentation about this. And, you know, I was like, so affected by the, the implications of what he was telling me that, um, well, maybe, uh, Maybe you should stay away from this if you're not really prepared for psychological challenges or, 
or maybe you know you need to do this kind of intervention where uh, you know there's some particular psychoactive substances that help you digest the shock. In any event, next slide, please. What's in this paper is the description of an effort at Google AI to build a model that they use for translation. Um, it is actually used in production today. Translates from any to any of 105 languages. The underlying model has 80 billion parameters. The underlying data that enables this has 25 billion sentence fragment examples. And it you know, gets even more impressive as you learn like what their concept of how they're gonna do this is. But you know, just as an example, this can translate from you know, Swahili into Croatian. This, there probably isn't any you know, previous example of translating from Swahili into Croatian. Perhaps no one ever thought to do that before. Uh, and the, uh, the, the particular way it's done, which is I found even more crazy, but like it's impressive that they can do it, is by translating images. Namely, there's just a picture of some text in Swahili, however that's rendered as text, and they create a picture of some text in Croatian. They don't even have an understanding that there's an alphabet that there's like a, they don't use a dictionary like it's in it like who would do this well this is what they do this is literally how they do that translation uh, in order to to train this model it takes months of runs using all the fancy tpus and and equipment that google ai has um, and so they have many of these models training with small tweaks at any time. And, you know, weeks and weeks after they start, they start looking in and looking at checkpoints and stuff. It's just a, an amazing edifice that's been constructed. And it's all in this last decade. This is an example of the revolution that we have just lived through and we don't completely assimilate and understand its significance, even now. Next slide, please. Now, of course, what that revolution is that we're talking about could also be associated with the phrase data science. Namely, data science is sort of harvesting the corollaries of all this massive transition to computational supremacy. And I think the intellectual assimilation of that transition is, is much delayed and we don't really understand it yet. And so there are a lot of habits of speaking about these things that are uh, that reflect our uh, lack of adjustment to what has just taken place. So just to understand the the, the juxtaposition of the old with the new, um, I just mention here two famous articles. One, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences, and the other, the unreasonable effectiveness of data. Um, one by a Nobel Prize winner in theoretical physics, and the other by you know, resident intellectuals at Google. The articles are you know, roughly 50 years apart and they stand for the transition that we've just gone through. We no longer speak about the idea that mathematics is gonna save us. We assume that whatever mathematics might have done, well, it had its chance. 
we're done with that. Now there's a new game in town. It's the game of computational supremacy and it's data supremacy. That's really what the second article announces. Next, please. There are, of course, massive differences between the two cultures. In the math first culture, which we had from the 1650s until about 2010, there were theory, models, you derived things, expressions, you did analysis, you reached an understanding, it was an academically driven field and what it produced was discourse, articles, discussion along the lines involving all the steps that are mentioned here. In the data first situation, which really has been you know, out there uh, depends when you want to date it. I'll say it's since the 1980s been happening, but you know, in specialized places that might not have been well recognized, but has really been so dominant since 2010. We don't have theory, we have empiricism. We don't have models, we have challenge problems of things that data sets and tasks that need to be attacked. We don't have derivation. We build things that we think need to be built. We don't derive formulas and expressions. We don't analyze things. We make measurements. We don't understand anything. We document performance. There is no academic component to this. It's industrial. There is no discourse about it. It makes products. I mean, the products could be predictions, the products could be stock portfolios, the products could be, you know, uh, strategies to do well in the Google ads lottery, but it's a different game. Next, please. Now, for, for many people who have the academic background, they don't really understand that the that theory is over and it's been replaced by challenge problems. So the challenge problems paradigm has been around since the mid 1980s, when the Department of Defense DARPA started funding challenge problems in um, various natural language processing and biometrics. So the fact that today uh, Siri or Alexa can hear your voice and know who you are and they can, ref they can discuss, uh, you know, they can understand things that you're saying, it's all because of this paradigm, not because of some ideas coming from math. What the paradigm combines is a, a set of ingredients which has come to be called the Common Task Framework by Mark Lieberman at University of Pennsylvania in the Natural Language Processing Group. It has these ingredients, a publicly available training data set, a set of competitors who's got, that have a common task that is to infer a class prediction rule from training data, and some sort of scoring referee, preferably robotic, uh, who runs the class prediction rule against sequestered data that's not available to anybody. So this was started by DARPA in the mid 80s and has been used successfully in many biometrics and other natural language tasks. Uh, it more or less describes the way Kaggle and famous competitions like ILS VRC, often called ImageNet. Next slide, please. And when it was used in the DARPA competitions, 
over the years, it had this amazing property that each year there would be really noticeable improvements in performance year after year. This was in the pre deep nets era and maybe people were using, you know, whatever they were using at the time, perhaps some electrical engineering derived filtering, some biologically inspired uh, type of um, data representation, some kind of hidden Markov, you know, chains. Whatever they were using, it was just always getting better year after year. It's like a machine that produces uh, uh, progress. And of course, the key point is it's a contest. There's a lot of competitors and they get paid, it, it, which could mean you know, grants, it could mean you know, actual money, whatever. Next slide, please. The essence of this is that there's a human tendency to respond to leaderboards by energetic competition. And uh, I'll just you know, put this slide out there. Sebastião Salgado, very distinguished photographer. These are some pictures he took early in his career where he discovered an open pit mine in Brazil. And people just literally were, you know, digging in this open pit and carrying, you know, burlap sacks of mud off and um, making money based on how many little flecks of gold they found in there. Uh, it turns out there were doctors in there, there were professors, all sorts of people were inspired by this gold rush. And that's perfect symbol for what these challenges have created. Next, please. Uh, a big event in the last 10 years was that Eric Schmidt, at the time chairman of Google, decided to write a check for several billion dollars to go on an unprecedented hiring spree, during which Google hired more than a thousand computer science researchers. That's about equal to the number of computer science researchers in academia in North America. So they created essentially their own counter discipline of computer science. All of these people under one person's control and they were set loose to push a certain technology, which because of one of these competitions ImageNet ILS VRC 2012, they believe this technology would be a good bet. And then uh, next slide, please. So the task of ImageNet challenges was based on things that came out of Lee Fei Fei's lab in 2009. And then um, next slide, please. Just like in all the previous cases, there was uh, tremendous progress year after year. And it's thought that for this particular data set, the, the human level of performance is at about where the networks are today. So they, they became human or maybe superhuman because humans could not actually run through the whole ImageNet data set. There just isn't lifetime in them. And, but you can get the accuracy that humans can muster in small bursts. Next slide, please. I just wanna emphasize that although deep nets have been said to be uh, extremely uh, you know, unique and so on and so forth, this is not unique. This is what has always happened with these challenges. And there's no real difference between what we saw in ILS VRC and what all the DARPA challenges did. The key point here is it's the data science revolution combined with the challenge definition that so drives machine learning that caused all of this. I, I, I don't see any evidence that there's a unique contribution of neural nets. What's unique 
is writing a check for several billion dollars and putting a thousand researchers full time onto one technology. Next slide, please. Uh, which created, you know, uh, among other things, all sorts of custom hardware was developed and TPUs and like even, you know, the, the next generation of Apple laptops is going to have stuff in it to speed up TensorFlow and PyTorch, like, like, you know, changed essentially in, as a ref as a reflected effect from Eric Schmidt's writing that check. You know, all sorts of things have to be done now differently. Next, please. So, and that's where we are with this computational supremacy that I've previously shown you. Next, please. Next, please. On the other hand, there are a lot of things there that are problematic. So I don't want people to think that this is necessarily the greatest situation. Uh, there's resource insatiability because, because there aren't deep ideas behind this. It's all driven by an insatiable appetite for data compute and researcher hours. And because it isn't based on ideation of the traditional type where you needed theorist permission to do stuff, you do stuff that has no explanation and then you make it up post facto what you think went on. This, both of these things are very inappropriate for universities, which is why academia is not in the game but they're also unsustainable. Like the, the, the benefits that have been seen during this decade can't be sustained. For example, GPUs are not gonna be able to scale uh, in the way that they have during this decade. They've, they've reached some limit. Next, please. Uh, so at, at the same time that we made 300,000 X increases in computing, we made, you know, 17% improvement in classification accuracy. So this accuracy has been bought at a fantastic cost. Next, please. And, you know, the, the thousands of careers that have been thrown at this thing, none of those people are equipped in any way for a different technology or a different purpose than just carrying burlap sacks through a muddy slog up a hill. Next, please. And uh, don't take it from me that the, you know, discourse is corrupted. You know, look, look at what the machine learning people in CS departments like at CMU or Stanford or elsewhere are saying. Next, please. So anyway, these are the cultural differences that, that have happened. Next, please. And the transition that takes is difficult for us to get used to. Next, please. Now I mentioned that credit has been stolen and I'm not actually suggesting that statistics is great and then you know people are just hiding all the great stuff that we've done. I don't think that you know these kind of snarky things like this cartoon and so on are uh, necessarily right. But I do think that the quote at the bottom of the slide is correct. When you're fundraising, it's AI. When you're hiring, it's ML when you're doing its logistic regression. Uh, that's, a, that's a fundamental comment, but it doesn't mean that statistics has created this revolution by no means. The revolution is definitely the data science computational supremacy axis. But the credit misattribution here is that there's some tendency to slap the label AI 
on this revolution and it is not correct to do that. So I just want to make it clear that we have to know what the revolution has been. Next, please. In fact, AI is a miserable failure. What it's been good at is running to the front of a parade. In this particular case, they're running to the front of a parade, which is people trying to run them out of town. Essentially, what machine learning and the contest challenge paradigm did is show that you don't need any of the ideas of AI. Next, please. And uh, you know, a more a very profound commentary on this can be found in the blog post by Rich Sutton, who's a distinguished researcher in uh, reinforcement learning, called the Bitter Lesson, in which he points out that basically everything that AI people, people who call themselves AI, have done is an utter failure. What has been a success is to never use ideas and just get more data and computing at the problem. And again, don't take it from me. Next, please. Uh, you, you can, you know, Rodney Brooks uh, has blog posts and talks where he says it'll be hundreds of years before we have general AI and that most of the stuff that you see in the media about AI is just, just atrocious. Next, please. So after talking about, you know, the idea that we've just gone through an AI revolution, he says in early 2019, the claims are ludicrous. You know, nothing has ever has happened in AI in those 10 years. This is a professor of robotics at MIT who's as well positioned to say as anything else. Next, please. And we're hundreds of years away from anything like AI. Next, please. So we've lived through a transformation of civilizational significance, but we don't recognize it because we just think it's a bunch of you know, teenagers making TikTok videos. What has happened is underlying it is the emergence of a global computational and communications network that's moved us into the era of computational supremacy. This creates all sorts of conceptual difficulties that we haven't adjusted to. It has almost nothing to do with AI. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, David. Very clear, thought-provoking, at times depressing, I'll say, from an academic perspective. But thank you very much uh, for your perspective. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Don here. And uh, you know, going back to a comment that Dave made about AI, once you get down to the nitty gritty details, is logistic regression. So I want to ask Don to contrast maybe statistics and data science. So Don, could you give us some color about what you think the average data scientist is doing well today and what is doing poorly? Uh, uh, I'm not sure. Well, first of all, I, I want to make, make a comment about the terminology data science. Uh, I did this old expression, uh, maybe uh, it's, it's from Tukey from, from years ago at, when I was at Princeton, that any field that needs science in its name is not science. And don't say chemistry science or physics science. Computer science isn't science. It's really engineering. And I think, I, I think that's pretty consistent with everything uh, David said, really. It's an engineering revolution where you take machines and you make them faster and faster and you have to cool them to make sure they don't fry themselves. Um, but it, but it's, it's, it's not science. What, 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 what is science? I in, in my world, science means understanding nature. And physics is about understanding physics and uh, 
chemistry is about understanding chemistry. Um, what is computer science about? What's engineering? Uh, and uh, and that's okay, but I but, but I think that that the uh, uh, name is deceptive. Also, um, I also found part of what David said is is kind of depressing. Maybe that's why I don't like to agree with it. Uh, basically, I, I think he sort of implied that ideas are dead in the field. Uh, and so therefore it doesn't make a, make a good academic field in that sense where, where ideas are paramount. So why do, why do we need ideas? Well, I, to me, I, ideas refer to understanding. And if you understand something, you can generalize beyond what you've seen. Um, and, I, and I think that's, that's something that's sort of missing from the usual uh, machine learning attitude. You're always doing tests on, on these uh, artificial examples, or sometimes they're real examples, but, but they're limited. Um, and, and with respect to that, I, I think one of the, one of the big uh, contributions of, of the field of statistics, uh, starting with, with Fisher, and then a bunch of guys who I actually met, you know, uh, Jersey Naiman, George Box, Bill Cochran, John Tukey, and David Cox. So the, the, the purpose of, of, of doing experiments and is, is to learn and to get understanding. And I think that, that the understanding that is typically generated by uh, machine learning or, or, or data science isn't really, doesn't generate that. Um, and, Understanding really means you understand something or you have a hypothesis about why something's true and you can address problems that are different from the collection of problems that have been presented. And in, and in fact, often you, uh, you, you, you get to, to do that by answering a different question than the one that's posed. And I don't think machines do that very well. They may be able to, to train machines to, uh, with the, collection of images or something to, to become better and, and better at, at solving the problem that you presented to them. But humans have a different ability. They, they, they have an, an ability to be creative and they can think about the, the problem that, that you, you've posed. And they often come up with a related but different problem that hasn't been posed. But that problem that they, they came up with um, is, is, is one that, um, that ha has answers. So instead of addressing the, the problem being asked, humans have the ability to find a problem that's close in some sense, that wasn't posed, but is solvable. Um, and, and I've, uh, and I, actually I, I, I wrote something that was published in an obscure place when I was in, in, in Beijing last year, uh, making this, this, uh, this point that um, humans' brains are not wired uh, like a bunch of computers. They, they change the problem into, into one that, that can be solved. Uh, and, and that's where I think many, many of the uh, great ideas came from. So I'm not sure that, that uh, I buy into David's uh, future, uh, or that, that it's a, or, or the game that, that will be played. You know, I certainly hope not. It I guess sounds sort of boring. I guess David presented the dichotomy to be thought provoking. Of course, there's a lot of sure. details and you know ways to be for us to be in the middle. And I'm hoping Michael Kohler will speak to some of that uh, toward the end. But thank you, Don. Thank sure. you for being here. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Michael. Um, you know, as uh, David was saying, the global computational supremacy, instead of AI, I should say now, um, you know, has recently brought up a resurgence of interest, um, you know, by chess and Go, you know, self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. And one, one aspect of this revolution that I was... Uh, stricken by was a series of papers by CEOs 
of you know Tesla and uh, Microsoft uh, or, or Bill Gates uh, and Google writing in science about how AI is going to take over the world and we should be you know wary of that. That that sort of is one of the things that caught my attention among other things about this AI phenomenon. But uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. Like Dave said, you've written about it in a nice article in the Harvard Data Science Review, in a piece that had several commentaries by academics, including Dave. And can you help us think through your perspective of the AI revolution, Michael? Uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me here. Um, so I just to say, I'd like to go through slides quickly, and I'm not the next person. I, I'm not hitting the button today. So whoever's doing that, be prepared, because I like to kind of move quickly. That's my style. Um, so let me just say I uh, really enjoyed it so far. Uh, it turns out that I think David and I agree on the phenomenon, and we agree on where you look to try to understand the phenomenon, which is really outside of academia. It's the outside world. And so I'm going to, the first part of this talk, I'm going to agree with him almost completely using my own language. Uh, but then I'm going to diverge. I, I don't have the same interpretation of where this is going and what, what, what the right way to think about this. There's going to be a little less depressive feeling, um, but that's okay. I'm in Italy and I can't get depressed when you're in Italy. Um, so next. First of all, I don't like this phrase AI. I think David's totally right at the end. This is not about AI. This is not about uh, intelligence of the humankind and putting in the computer. It's about massive brute force data analysis and the, and the implications of that. Okay. My view on this is that it actually is the emergence of a new engineering field. And I would not say just engineering. And we like to do science and that's just engineering. That, I think that's the wrong way to think. Think about chemical engineering in the 40s and 50s. Uh, before the 40s and 50s, there was not chemical engineering. There was chemistry. There was quantum physics. There was fluid flow. There was a physical understanding of the world at the level, you know, amazing level. But then people thought, is it possible to build systems that do this at scale? Could I make a factory that takes in inputs and produces outputs, which are new products, new materials, plastics, uh, you know, new kinds of clothing, um, things that have changed the world, arguably more than anything we're talking about right now. Um, and in the 40s, 50s, young people, this is what they were excited about. And to develop this field, first of all, they had to try it out. They built some factories, some of which didn't work, some of just which exploded, some of which just didn't make the product. Uh, and money was made, money was lost. There was a Wild West moment. But there was also the development of a field called chemical engineering. And it really arose in that era of uh, people both being inspired by the, the physics and the chemistry, but also inspired what's happening in the outside world and trying to make sense of it. And new principles were developed, new ideas, as Don was saying. It wasn't just engineering, quote unquote, it was new concepts, new thermodynamic ideas at scale. And if you take, uh, if you become a major in chemical engineering now, you're not just learning engineering tricks, you're learning a whole bunch of mathematical concepts that were, that were figured out. And, you know, years later, we have had a successful field that has changed the face of civilization. Uh, it's had its problems because it's a powerful technology. I, I know less about the history of electrical engineering, but I'm sure it's very similar. You know, go back about 50 years before that, there was electromagnetism. There was Maxwell's equations. Uh, what more do you need? You have everything. Right? But then people thought, well, is it possible to electrify a city or a country? How could I bring power across vast distances? How could I bring power into a home? How do I build circuits? So principles like impedance matching, which were sort of implicit in electromagnetism, but weren't really brought out, had to be brought out so you could make modular systems and make them work at scale. And you could start to make them work at planetary scale. And new phenomena started to emerge. And then new mathematics was needed to support this. And that field is called electrical engineering. And if you get an electrical engineering degree, you know a lot of mathematics, all right? So I think that's actually what's happening right now. We have uh, three centuries of inferential thinking, inferential ideas, and algorithmic ideas. I think computer science actually is not just engineering. It has a lot of real ideas in it. And if you put the two together, you start to get what we might call data science. And you start to get this planetary scale flow of data and flow of value and flow of business models. That's, that's what we're actually seeing in the outside world. And that's just like in the 40s and 50s, people building chemical factories. We're doing it without really knowing what we're doing. Sometimes it works and great things happen like a search engine. Some things, sometimes, you know, cell phones work. Other times really bad things happen like, you know, election, election manipulation or fake news and all that. And we're just kind of making up as we go. And so what we need is a new field of engineering which has its principles like impedance matching or thermodynamics at scale that learn how to talk about human desires, preferences and values at planetary scale with data flows as the underlying currency. So economics, microeconomics talked about a lot of this, but they never had data flows and compute. David's right about the compute, but it's not just the compute. 
It's the data flows and the value associated with data flows. And we need a language to talk about that and a language for design and analysis. Next. Okay, so MLAI is just a small piece in this bigger picture. Um, and I'm gonna move away from that phraseology. I think ML is kind of fine. Um, but uh, if you want to use that term for terminology, you have to recognize there's two sides to it. One of them is pattern recognition which is typically label data sets and massive amounts of data and finding the patterns that allow you to sort of interpolate and in some sense, narrowly generalize. And that's what the neural net and the deep learning and, and so on have been about. And it's become a commodity. Um, so you can have massive data sets, but also the software is available, right? Is that everything? Well, there's some people in the ML community who argue it is, you know, that if you can predict really, really well, you can do everything. I totally disagree. And there's another side of the field, which is also active, it's just less prominent. It's the decision-making side. And it has to do with making high stakes decisions, not deciding whether there's a bunny in the image or something like that. It's like, uh, should you have a heart operation? And it's about explanations for decisions and it's about sequences, about simultaneous, and it's also about multiple decision makers and market mechanisms. If you don't start to embrace this and you're building systems that are helping making decisions at planetary scale, then you're not actually building systems that are gonna work. Next. Okay, so if this is all true, what I'm saying, you should have seen it in the outside world. This shouldn't have been an academic invention that was somehow picked up by people and eventually led to something. It should have already been present, just like chemical engineering was present. And I think it has been. Uh, so I think the first generation was already in the 1990s. Companies like Amazon and eventually Alibaba and so on built back-end systems that could do things that humans could not do. For example, fraud detection had to be brought down to 0.01% instead of 3%. So you could do commerce on the internet. Otherwise you could have done commerce. And how do they do this? They take in massive amounts of data. They built computer farms. The rich origins of the cloud were there. Okay, it wasn't for AI or any of this later stuff. It was for building fraud detection systems back in 1990, right? And they did it really well. And they built systems that brought it down to 0.01% and you could do e-commerce, e okay? And humans can't do that. Even more importantly, supply chain management, right? If you're selling a billion products, which is what Amazon and Alibaba are currently doing to hundreds of millions of people. Uh, you have to have a model of the supply chain that's extremely detailed and extremely accurate, extremely well calibrated, getting ships across the Indian Ocean, how long does it take and so on and so forth. And they did that. And they did that with huge, massive amounts of data and compute. Okay, So that's the area it was actually done. And that led to billion dollar industries and has changed our world. So it's already sitting there. And that was a big engineering system kind of done hook by hook or by crook. All right. Um, the second generation to me was the human side. You realize that a lot of this data wasn't just about supply chains and ships and, you know, with trains and all that. It had human data in it. And so things like recommendation systems took human transactions, preferences and so on, and uh, led to making predictions that helped people with their decision making at scale, at scales of hundreds of millions. E-commerce, social media started to raise, rise in that period. Same underlying technology, same underlying big farms of computer systems. Eventually the cloud started to emerge in this era and, and same massive data sets and same sort of thoughtlessness about what it was all meant, but it led to a billion dollar industry, all right? This third generation is what I think is happening now. I, it's what I would call pattern recognition. It's the deep learning, it's the speech recognition, computer vision, and I'm less impressed than David is, okay? So translation, yes, you, you look at Swahili to go into Croatian, whatever, it's really striking. Um, but there's zero understanding of those sentences happening. And I speak some of the, I speak multiple languages and I always see errors, even to this day. They don't quite get it because they're not understanding what's being said. Oh, they're copying strings to strings or as Steve had said, images to images. If I start to have a dialogue with one of these systems or if I have a dialogue with David, he and I are gonna build up a shared understanding of what the heck we're talking about. Maybe there's some event in the world we're talking about, it's gonna happen tomorrow and somebody's gonna come and this is gonna happen. I'm gonna to start to form a mental model of what the heck he's talking about. It's gonna have social components and physical components and temporal components and all that. And as we develop this shared understanding, well, our language will continue to refer to the entities which are only in our head. And the, the systems that are doing translation now cannot even come close to that minimally. They're, they are totally bad at that, all right? So I am not nearly as impressed. I don't think we're getting any understanding and without understanding, you're not really doing anything that's human. Okay, you're doing something else. Again, it's it's something big. I agree with Dave there. It leads to you could commoditize it, you can make you know money, but it's not the real thing. Okay. Actually, I think what's already emerging is something more interesting, which is something which is often called Internet of Things, 
in the CS world, but that's kind of just the boring problem of putting things on the on you know, giving IP addresses to everything. It's really this fact that we have flows of data and decisions across the world in commerce, in transportation, in medical care. The, the whole pandemic response is a ad hoc network of people fl flying things, you know, data and decisions and, and, and occasionally experiments and so on um, all around, uh, hoping to damp down, you know, like an immune system would do uh, um, a, a, a uh, pandemic. Next. Okay, so let me dig in a little bit more to this decision making side because the pattern recognition side gets so much attention and people think it's everything. So um, let's think concretely about you go into your doctor's office and your doc and you know in five years and your doctor's going to measure all kinds of things about you. You know your uh, you know your heart rate, your your blood pressure, and so on, but also your genome because that's going to be cheap and a whole bunch of other stuff. So like a thousand hundred thousand dimensional feature vector will go into a big neural network uh, that has all the world's medical knowledge in it. It's a huge data set and massive computers were used. It becomes the super doctor, right? Is it actually gonna be a good doctor, right? And the answer is absolutely not. So for example, one of the output units of that network will be like the heart attack in the output unit. And if that number is over 0.7, then in the historical data, that suggests you're about ready to have a heart attack and have, have an operation. If you sitting in your doctor's office in that moment, are you gonna say, yeah, oh my God, the world's smartest thing just told me I'm gonna have a heart attack, I better have an operation. No, absolutely not, right? You're gonna first of all say, wait a minute, what's your error bar on that? Um, am I just, just over 0.7? And moreover, where did the error bar come from? Was this data gathered last week? Was it gathered 10 years ago? What's the provenance of this data? Was it about people like me? Is it about some other people? Uh, was it the same machines that I'm being tested on today? And so on and so forth, we're gonna have a whole dialogue. Again, where a neural network is not gonna be able to support that dialogue, we're gonna have counterfactuals, we're gonna say, if we were to try out this other, you know, if I were to eat better, also you're gonna remember things about your lifestyle that you never thought of before. That, oh, you know, did you know that I actually had a, uh, you know, uh, back in, when I was younger, I had a respiratory problem. I forgot all about that. And the whole point is that's not in that neural network. It's not the world's best doctor because it doesn't know everything. It can't because all kinds of things occur to people as they interact with the world around them and they think through the consequences of various things. All right, so I could go on about this, but you know, the provenance, the relevance, the counterfactual, the dialogue, that's what real intelligence and learning and decision making are about. And none of that is present in our current massive compute world. All right. All right. Secondly, it's never about just one decision. I've been making multiple decisions today, and there are different scales and different scope. What do I eat? You know, what do I talk about? How do I interact with my children? And, and so on. And then it's gonna happen over days and over weeks. Right. It's moreover sets of decision that have interlocking decision makers. All of us are interlocking in our decision making and there's going to be scarcity. We can't all have the same thing and we're going to have to fight for it and compete. Next. All right. So let's just really be very concrete about this. Let's take pattern recognition and see how far it goes. So classical recommendation systems are a pattern recognition system. And you know all what they are. If you go to Amazon, you buy a few books. They cluster you with other people who bought similar books and they recommend some other books that those people bought. So it's massive data in a brute force way. They become a commodity. They're on the prediction side of ML. If you use them for movies and books, you can make billions of dollars. And that's what has happened. What if you use them for other real world things where there's scarcity? Next slide. All right. So suppose I start using this commodity, this wonderful pattern recognition box to recommend things like restaurants to people. Now, if only a few people are using the app, then no problem, they'll be very happy to get sent to nice restaurants. But what if everybody in Shanghai is using the app, right? Then by chance alone, that app, it will, it's a pattern recognition system, it'll just pattern recognize and send you know, 10,000 people to the same restaurant, all right? And that's Poisson statistics, it'll happen day after day, that kind of problem will arise. Or if you recommend streets to drivers because they're the fastest streets to the airport, if everyone starts using the app, then you're gonna create congestion. Right. If you recommend stock purchases and everyone is using your app, you're going to destabilize the market and so on and so forth. It's all the interactions among decisions. And here's the point. This is not pattern recognition anymore. Right. I don't know which street I want to go down because I don't know how much of a hurry I'm really in until you make me think about it. And if you run an auction, I'm going to have to think about it. But before you ran the auction, I didn't have to think about it. All right. Which restaurant do I want to go to? All right, here's where Silicon Valley and the big data, Googles and all that get it wrong, Facebook especially. They think you're gonna understand how to load balance. That, oh, 10,000 people I'm sending to the same restaurant, that's the problem. What I'm gonna do is decide these 50 here go to that restaurant, these 50 go to some other restaurant. How do I decide? Well, I know enough about these people because I have all their browsing history. I have all this huge amount of data. I can know them 
and I can decide which ones they should go to. And I hope you realize how ridiculous this is, but that's actually where the big data, you know, uh, data science people have gone. They think they can figure it out and they can't, right? Partly because I don't even know in that moment. I think, you know, okay, I see that restaurant looks really interesting. I try that out, you know, Thai food. I never had that before and so on and so forth. So really the way to think about this is we're all involved in markets all the time. We're involved in scarcity and that has to interact with the data analysis. Next slide. So the alternative to just thinking about massive data kind of in super compute changing our world is that no, that's not right because we have to always make decisions in the context of complex other people's decisions and scarcity and over long stretches of time. And the only mechanisms I know to do that has nothing to do with data analysis per se, it's markets. They've been working for thousands of years. They adjust themselves over time and they're not perfect, right? And they're gonna be made better and new phenomena will arise and new thinking will need be needed as we put microeconomics together with statistical data analysis. Because that's what microeconomics people have never done. They've had all the numbers, the preferences, the game table known, and then you work out the consequences. What if those are not known and people have to experiment like in a bandit situation? Next slide. All right, so markets are really algorithms. And um, this is not a very computer science-y kind of thing to say. Computer scientists were deductive logic and they put it in the computer and then they brought in data and it made it a little bit inductive. But markets are a whole other thing and we really need to have them in here. And of course we have to work more on this. We're gonna need a hundred years of work on this because markets are not perfect. They have to be regulated in many ways. And that's the old style markets. These new markets that are emerging are gonna have all, all kinds of new phenomena. Next slide. I'm gonna give you a very concrete example, um, music. There's more music being listened to today than ever before in history by factors of tens to hundreds. More people making it than ever before. That's amazing, all right? Um, so you think there's this flourishing market and there's, there's no market, all right? And um, data science is needed here. So uh, what do I mean by this? Well, if you actually look at data, it turns out that 95% of the songs being listened to today uh, in the US uh, were made by people you never heard of and uh, were made in the last two years. So it's not that the huge, uh, you know, Beyonce's or whatever that everyone's listening to them. No, kids walking around with the headphones on are listening to the latest, coolest thing, right? Well, the people who made that are probably other 16 year olds who on their laptop are really good at making music and put it on SoundCloud. Then the computer science community steals their, their bits, takes the economic value out of it and streams the bits to other people and then restores economic value by advertising against it. They created a fake market on the side of the real market they should have created, which is linking producer and consumer and making economic value flow between the person who wrote the song and the person that listened to the song. Next slide. All right, so how do you fix this? You don't have to go into super intelligence of any kind. You don't have to do anything particularly novel. You just have to do core data science. You think about data science not as doing translation and mimicking humans. You think about it as creating a new kind of market. And to start with, it's really easy. You take each person who's a musician who makes enough music that they're being listened to by people. At the end of the week, they get to see a dashboard, which is a map of the country they live in. And there's a dot every time someone has listened to one of their songs. Right? And they now discover that, uh, you know, in Dayton, Ohio, 10,000 people listened to my songs last week for whatever reason, I don't know why, but I'm popular there. This is just data science, no understanding. But now I can show that to the venue owner in Dayton. They can see the same data I'm looking at and they can say, yeah, you're popular here. Let's invite you, you give a show, you make $20,000. You do that three times during the year, you have a salary. Okay, you're not gonna be Beyonce and super money, but you have a salary. You can scale this to a billion people in a given country. Right? They, then they're also connected to their fans. There's producer consumer relationships. They can say, I'll come play your wedding for $10,000. Uh, you'll say 5,000, I'll say 8,000. We created a market. Great things can start to happen because data now is associated with economic value. It's not just data is data and it's bits on a computer. And by the way, a friend of mine, Steve Stout, is, uh, is, has a company called United you know, Masters, which is doing exactly this. He's got 500,000 music, young musicians signed to this and the music that you'll hear on AT&T and on the NBA right now is his musicians. So this is actually happening. I've been working with Steve for five years on this. Next slide. All right, so the consequences of this is that AIs or whatever you wanna call it, I don't like that term, but it, it's uh, you know data science uh, using massive amounts of data can be a job creator, right? Cause you gotta create new markets and it doesn't have to be just music. It could be like, you know, I'm building a new house right now. I'd like some art in my house. And I'd like people to bid on my house and it could be just anybody. It's not just a famous artist who, who bids on it. And if we created a, a, a connection there. So 
are any companies doing this other than say Steve Stout? Well, in some ways like Uber is more like this, you know, Facebook, no, Google, no. And I think those companies are not innovated anymore because they're not creating new markets. And uh, Amazon, yes, they bring packages to people's doors. So they created a new market. And I think they're still innovating. And I think you can really put companies on the left or right. Are they creating a new market? Then they're actually also doing technological innovation. If they're not creating a new market like Google or Facebook, they're kind of not innovating anymore. And I don't see Google and Facebook actually as innovating. Next slide. Okay, so if you're an academic, are you uh, really intrigued by working on this kind of thing? And yeah, you should be because there's tons of new problems, all of them conceptual ones at the interface of machine learning or statistical you know, data and econ. Multi-way markets in which individuals have to explore to learn their preferences, like bandits meet um, markets. Large-scale multi-way markets. If I'm trying to decide between 100,000 restaurants in Shanghai, there's no way I could explore all of them. I can't have preferences about them. I have to do some kind of a recommendation system to get other people's preferences to inform mine so we can start to play the game. All right? Never been studied in econ. Totally appropriate for the real world. All right? Incentive-aware classification evaluation. Auctions in which preferences are learned. And then if you're, there's a lot of discussion of privacy and fairness and social good, well, these are econ related concepts. You can't talk about that unless you talk about people's utility and people have different utilities. And so how do we find principles for building this kind of fair, fair system where learning is intermixed mixed with the, um, the, the game theory and the mechanism design? Next slide. Next. Okay, really two minutes just to give you a flavor for the if there are any academics here. I kind of tuned this uh, for CEOs, but just to let you say, here's a project with two of my students where we bring together bandits and matching markets. Learning on the one side, econ on the other. Next slide. All right, here's my favorite learning problem is there's several options. Here's there's only three, but there could be 10,000. I don't know which one is, is uh, my favorite one, so I pull one of the arms. Next slide. Just now start paging for a while. Next, next, next. So you get a reward, you pull another arm, you get a reward, keep going, keep going. All right, and you start to learn about these arms and you get a confidence interval. And there's an algorithm which says, pick the highest confidence bound, the upper confidence bound arm. Next slide, just keep paging for a while. You pick that arm, all right? And that has the uncertainty as well as the trying to optimize your reward built into it. And um, keep going, please just keep, keep paging. Um, so stop there for a second. Um, so that's on the learning side, and there's beautiful theory about it. And it's a real thing. Out in industry, you do A-B tests, and they're built on this kind of technology. On the econ side, there's been Nobel Prize for this, but it's really important too. Uh, and um, uh, in the real world, matching markets. On the one side, buyers. On the other side, sellers. You have preferences known a priori. That's what we're not going to have anymore. Uh, but after, if you know the preferences, there's algorithms like Gail Shapley, which match things. Next. All right. So what if we put these two together? What if we have, next slide. On the one side, multiple agents, and they're competing with each other. They're both trying to learn about which is the best arm. All right, next slide. But from time to time, they'll both pick the same arm. And we have an econ model there, scarcity. Both of them can't get that arm, sorry. So what's gonna happen? Next slide. The arm has preferences back on the other side, the left side of the market. And so it's gonna say, I prefer the bear. I'm gonna give the bear the reward and the human gets no reward. And now you ask, how do the humans behave in this situation? And there's new algorithms needed. And uh, next slide. Uh, we develop such a market, uh, a, a bandit market algorithm. Next slide. Next slide. Um, let me just skip this. I wanted to say you can do, the, the, there's mathematics here. You can do new notions of regret. Next slide. And you can have an algorithm. It's, it's Gail Shapley meets upper confidence bounds. And you can tell agents how to, to, to behave in very, very large scale markets. So the overall system actually learns and people get what they want. Next slide. Uh, here's the piece of mathematics that says, how do you do that? And here's a penalty. It's a statistical bound, but it has an econ penalty in the denominator. Next slide. Okay, so my last little section here, um, take about, you know, most five more minutes, is that I want to now pop up a little bit to the next level, you know, back to kind of the real world, not just academics, and think about how to build the future, if you agree with my perspective here. Well, first of all, it's very much industry academic partnerships. All right, so the real problems I think are mostly in industry. And if you go out there, they had the word data science long before academics did. Um, and also you need new distributed software platforms because um, uh, there's no way you can build an engineering discipline without them. And these are rise in academia. That's actually the, the open source movement has made that happen. No one buys software from, uh, from companies anymore. And then startups are the, the critical bridging role between these two things. Next slide. 
So I'm just going to mention uh, a project uh, with a bunch of colleagues at Berkeley. Where we built we've built a program a, a platform called Ray, um, which is being used at Amazon. It's being used at uh, banks. It's being used at Alibaba in China in production. We did it as academics, and it basically is an econ data science platform uh, that allows you to run on massive computers. The kind of things Dave was talking about econ related. Um, uh, data science problems. We created a company uh, called AnyScale that does this. And, uh, um, you know, the previous company that my colleague Jan Stoika did called Databricks is now valued, I think, at 13, 2.2 billion. Um, and um, it didn't do any econ stuff. So we think we have a, you know, a clear business model here. Next slide. I'm going to go ahead and should I finish in one minute? Uh, I want to leave time for um, Ado, just tell me, okay? Yes, yeah, like let's say four, six more minutes. So okay, let me let me try to do four on the lower side of that. Uh, so Ray is, uh, you know, the current machine learning ecosystem. So this is behind what David was talking about. You have training, you have serving, you have streaming, you have uh, re uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, the algorithms were developed on a single computer. Next slide, and then people said, oh, how do we make this be a distributed system so we can do it at this massive scale? And separate software stacks were developed for each of those capabilities. Often these were done in academics but Google did some of them as well. Um, next slide. Ray says, no, let's get rid of all that. Let's build one distributed system, which is underlying, and then everything else is libraries on top of that. Next slide. And conceptually, this is actually a really, really simple notion. Python is a big success because it has functional programming and it has object-oriented programming. The big wave of activity at Google to build MapReduce and so on was all functional programming. MapReduce is functional programming. They got rid of objects because that didn't scale. Next slide. But if we're going to do things like dialogues and have massive neural nets as part of our ecosystem, but not only embedded in bigger ones, you have to have objects and functions. So Ray does exactly that. Next slide. And so three years of work. Um, now there's several hundred people contributing to this has led to an underlying infrastructure that does all the handling of objects and actors with scheduling and management and, and so on and so forth. Next slide. This is an example of taking a piece of software. It's a piece of Python code that someone wrote um, at Deep Mind and um, uh, trying to do a hyperparameter search. And it was working fine at small scale. And they wanted to run it on tens of thousands of computers to do AlphaGo kind of things. They said, how do we do this really easily? We don't have the time to build it. Next slide. So they just added a few uh, red lines there that made it a Ray ready program. It could run now in Ray, which allowed it to immediately scale to any scale of computers. So you just added like four lines and um, that was it. So next slide. Here is an example uh, you may have heard of Ant Group that almost had an IPO. <laughs> um, well, inside of Ant Group is this uh, is Ray. And uh, so here's an example. The, these programs take in on a, on a cell phone uh, they featureize it, they put that in a big training, and then they serve the model back to the cell phone. Um, as of a couple of years ago, this was happening once a day. And um, they spent a huge amount of engineering effort to get it down to one hour after like a year of work. And that increased their uh, revenue hugely. Next, uh, next slide. Um, they then implemented it using Ray. They brought Ray in and they contributed to the open source development. Chinese people did, amazingly. Anyway, it came down from an hour to five minutes using Ray with no change to the software. And that was also a massive economic boom. Next slide. It's open source. Next slide, there's the GitHub. You can go there yourself right now and start contributing to it. Um, the growth is now matching Spark. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, geometric growth. Um, um, so Spark is the number one platform worldwide, by the way. Um, so we think we'll match that. We are matching that. Next slide. Um, contributors slide, next slide. And then some of you might be, oh, sorry, that's the library on top of it right now. I want to get one more slide. Next slide. And so here's some of the companies that are actually using this in production. Uh, so the main point I wanted to make here was not so much bragging about what we did, but rather that surprisingly industrial problems at scale are being solved by academic software. And if you haven't kind of been following that, I hope that you're awake to this. So Goldman Sachs is using this, Microsoft, Ant Financial, Amazon, and so on and so forth. And I think the next slide is my final slide. Okay, so that's a slide I already had up there before, um, but I hope to prevent present, prevent a, uh, a misunderstanding. AI is not happening. I totally agree with Rod Brooks. The real deep understanding involving like understanding language and all that, not even close. Um, 
But what we're missing and why the revolution hasn't really happened yet is not just that. That's certainly that's what I was writing about in that article. But really, it's because we're not thinking about markets. We're not thinking about the planetary scale systems that involve humans and their preferences and actions and scarcity. So we're the only way to get us all to be happy and have value is to put all this stuff we've been talking to get together with uh, microeconomics. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, very interesting perspective, lots of new information. Um, you know, we are on the last leg of this uh, session. Um, so I'd like to turn, to turn it over to Michael Kohler uh, with just a brief recap. So we heard from David, compute and data supremacy. We heard from Don, a role for understanding the world through experimentation and the role of big ideas. I think Michael also agrees with the role for big ideas and you know presented uh, his own characterization of, of the future focused on understanding, decision, and coordination among the decisions. And you know, for example, through markets. Um, and uh, I think everyone agrees on this session that, that there's nothing to AI. So that, that was surprising and interesting. And actually, I do agree with that, with a point. And I want to poke one more hole into a current way that AI is portrayed. And I think uh, I'd like to hear Michael's perspective on that. So AI has been portrayed that as deep learning largely, right? And so first of all, when I think of deep learning, it's just another technique like linear models or uh, you know, uh, uh, mixture models and so on and so forth that has been chosen and has been supported by a huge amount of, of resources. And second, deep learning has uh, serious limitations themselves. And so I'm just a user of deep learning, if any. Uh, Michael has actually uh, done some in-depth technical analysis of deep learning models, in particular, over-parameterized deep learning models and you know, uh, I would like to hear from you, Michael, your your opinion about you know deep learning models or from metrized deep learning models in particular. When you know what kind of conditions they need to really perform at the level that's been portrayed in the media in terms of say amount of data that's needed or signal to noise ratio. Do these models ever break down, Michael? Okay, well, let me start. I'm not sure whether I will actually answer your question. Let me first start by by saying that I I. Okay, I should make my. Uh, I, I really like both talks, and and I'm I'm one who is working on the mathematical foundation of deep learning since uh, several years already, and uh, I have first to confess. Uh, I think we are at the beginning with this, so I think we have some results for the pattern recognition, but nothing on the decision making. So the decision making will be maybe in in the future, but let me. Talk more about a pattern recognition instead of pattern recognition, you usually make it in regression. So you study these kind of estimates in, uh, as regression estimates, and then you look uh, what can you say about them. And there are several aspects on this. The first one thing, regression, that's a function estimation problem. So if you estimate a function with a special class of, say, neural networks, you have some kind of approximation, approximation problems. And there's a lot of understanding in the recent years about the approximation with deep neural networks because we learned about that we can approximate with these networks uh, rather perfect or rather good uh, piecewise polynomials, or basically uh, lines, multiple lines with three knots, and, uh, uh, and, and that's great. And then the second point is because of the network structure, it's easy to uh, approximate also, if you can approximate some kind of function, you can approximate compositions of, of functions. And uh, that leads to great results about uh, the, uh, uh, about dimension reduction in high dimensional regression problems. Uh, and there are, there are, as I so, uh, told you already, there are several aspects on the, on the deep learning. One is the approximation. The second one is the generalization because you learn this function uh, from some noisy data. This is nowadays also well understood if you use the, not if you, if you use under parametricized uh, neural networks then you can just use the classical Wapnik Chernenke theory that's well understood, but the big open problem is the uh, optimization. So somehow you define your estimate by minimizing some uh, empirical risk, and then you have to solve this minimization problem. And uh, that's where the over-parameterization comes into, into play, because uh, there was a recent uh, line of research tried to show, okay, if you or who actually showed, if you, if you use over-parameterized over 
neural networks, then it's easy to solve the optimization problem because you will find even with Scravia and the salient uh, uh, network which interpolates your training data more or less. But uh, I have strong doubts whether that's successful in terms of generalization. Okay, I think that's my comments. Thank you, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, the the papers by Michael and the paper by Belkin et al. on PNES that Michael has uh, referenced are actually on the content page uh, of our library. So I think uh, if I did receive quite an amount of questions, uh, which you know was expected, but we're like four minutes uh, to the end of this panel. So I think I'd like to thank um, Dave and Don and Mike and Michael very much for their contribution. Uh, and for making time today, thank you very much. It's been great having you here.